The 2019 Bigger Parade was an exceptionally miserable affair as about half the usual number of anti-choice marchers prayed their way down O'Connell Street to a much smaller stage area in front of the Customs House. They say imitation is the greatest form of flattery and it couldn't have felt truer than on Saturday's march. They were recycling chants from pro-life, it's a lie, you don't care if women die, to pro-choice, it's a lie, you don't care if babies die, which sounds very familiar to anyone who's attended a pro-choice rally march and demo over the past number of years. Most notably, however, with the mass-produced printed placards that were obviously made to look homemade. We assume this is in an attempt to imitate the organic nature and some of the wit that surrounds the many memorable DIY signs made annually for the March for Choice. It's clearly a cynical ploy to appear grassroots-led, a key feature of the repeal campaign, when they are anything but. Printing of a high-quality placard isn't cheap and certainly isn't an option for grassroots-led organisations or individuals whose finances are unlikely to stretch that far. These placards amusingly and ironically stated the North protects, with the words is next crossed out. Now less than a week later, the UK MPs have voted to extend same-sex marriage and abortion to the North of Ireland. Every year, the front banner of the anti-choice march has all the young people on the march stuck on it, creating an entirely misleading impression. Uh, basically, as soon as this passes, you'll see the age group suddenly go shooting up by about three or four decades. This is because the anti-choice movement has a very significant challenge, and that is that it has got very little support amongst under 50s. In fact, only 21% of people under 50 voted no in the referendum last year. Far-right agitators had a much more visible presence on this year. In previous years, they were there, but generally kept a low profile. This year, the National Party even had uniform leafleters handing out their variant of hate, while far-right YouTubers live-streamed from the march itself, all unchallenged by any steward. And they were pretty aggressive, uh, one of them even confronting Save 8 spokesperson John McGurk for not being into their racist conspiracy theories. It's increasingly obvious that the mainstream right-wing leadership of the anti-choice movement are under pressure from the far right, even as the numbers marching dwindle. We had a couple of observers along the parade route, but didn't carry out the same sort of elaborate counting operation we had ahead of the anti-choice march held March 10th of last year. On that occasion, it was important to be able to rapidly counter their expected lies about numbers taking part, and we quickly deflated their ludicrous 100,000 claim with our count of 9,400. This year, with the referendum won, we were more interested in observing the far right on the march and how they interacted with organisers and the crowd in general. For the curious, though, we counted 4,130 participants. There has been an uptake in violent racism internationally, fuelled by far right YouTubers in the last year. In Ireland, we've observed many previously anti repealed social media accounts amplifying racist memes and talking points. There have also been racist attacks, including three arson attacks on planned direct provision centres. At the same time, the mainstream anti-choice leadership have visibly had their fingers burnt on a couple of occasions through their flirtation with the far right. They are envious of its ability to attract a narrow layer of angry young straight white men that they can't otherwise reach, but then find themselves linked to the virulent racism and conspiracy theories such types put out. The mainstream anti-choice leaders have astounding levels of media access considering that they now represent such a small percentage of the population. So being visibly linked to racist cons conspiracy promoters threatens that media access. The far-right concerns us not because there are a lot of these far-right types, there are very few, and even less willing to show their face in public, but because, observing events elsewhere, there is a pattern of the far-right using social media to incite angry straight white men into violent action. There has been many such murders in the last couple of years, in fact so many that they often only get reported on in local media even if big massacres still make the international headlines. 2018 in the United States, for instance, had the fourth highest number of extremist killings since 1970, and every single one of those killings was associated with the far right. The largest and least far right of the new right-wing parties is Aintu, forming around anti-choice members of Sinn Féin. It's trying to position itself as a socially hard right, but economically progressive. But the reality is that in local elections, it had a candidate who posted great replacement conspiracy theory materials to our social media. Now, that's the conspiracy the New Zealand mass murder was motivated by when he shot up two mosques in Christchurch, murdering 51 people, one of them just three years old. Aintu had the largest by far political bloc on the march, and there was a scattering throughout of people wearing Aintu shirts. Renewa was the only other political party with a sizable block of perhaps 80, somewhat to our surprise as we thought they only had about three members at this point, as their high-profile egos have long abandoned them. 
Apart from a lot of virulent anti-choice stuff, they seem to currently be big into climate crisis, denialism and opposing sex education. The rest of the political presence was the dregs of the far right. Justin Barrett's National Party had a second in command, carrying a National Party umbrella, and a couple of young men in the late teens or early 20s wearing a sort of suit and tie uniform and distributing National Party branded leaflets. YouTuber Tan Torino was walking around the protest live streaming, and it was noticeable that he got a good number of people on the march recognised and greeted him positively, despite his channel consisting of attempts at provocation around plant direct provision centres and boosting a range of weird far-right conspiracy theories. Up to and including the barking QAnon one that believes Trump is sending secret messages to his supporters whenever he misspells words in, in his tweets. Um, we'd presume Tan standing with elderly anti-choice bigots is down to more traditional leaders like John Waters going onto his podcasts to do long interviews about how terrible people opposing racism are. Also present was the new kid on the block from Donegal who stars himself in The Patriot, uh, despite being the sidekick of Tan Torino who joined the British Army in the 1990s. It was him that doorstep John McGurk for not buying into racist conspiracy theories. After the rally, he had a Twitter spat with Justin Barrett, who posted a clip from his live stream without giving him any credit. Uh, Gemma O'Doherty yet again failed to put in an appearance. She seems to have largely abandoned on-street live streams after being confronted by the mother of one of the children she had targeted in Longford, and was completely unable to do anything on that day other than scuttle away. The only other far-right woman present was from Generation Identity, although they've fallen silent after being videoed taking part in the Loyalist protest in Belfast, followed by their international leader being linked to the New Zealand mass killer. Finally, a couple of the people associated with trying to set up a far-right version of the Yellow Vests uh, were also around, although that initiative has also collapsed once its true nature was exposed. We didn't spot either Gilroy or Kelly, both no doubt recovering from their electoral humiliation, nor for that matter did we see Nazi and wannabe Archdrude McGrath, uh, who these days seems to mostly focus, focus on his fake musical Kenny journal page. Apart from these absences, the Rally for Life was an unhappy convergence of the far right, but it had been notable that there was little or no communication or support between the different outfits. This despite the fear of milkshaking expressed by some. Tan even claimed to have had his hat snatched off its head by Antifa at one point in his live stream, uh, this despite an obviously not very competent mind of following him around in a pulled up collar, sunglasses and baseball cap. The picture from a monitoring of the day, keeping an eye on the social media and cough sources, is of a movement of grifters bitterly divided against each other. Some of this spills out in public, but what we've been told, it's a whole lot much worse behind closed doors.